you all. All right, we are live. Uh, thanks everyone for being with us today. I recognize some of the names I'm seeing here and then there's some others that I don't. Um, you did have choices on what you could do with this hour and I'm totally delighted that you chose to spend the hour with us. And I'm hoping at the end of it, you will be glad that you made that choice too. In fact, the only thing that I wish could be different about this um, uh, webinar or, or a Zoom meeting is that I wish we could have done it a month or two earlier. We've been, uh, at, like all of the rest of you who are in the elections world, we have been working as hard as we can to try to be things, but things keep changing. And this is about a timely topic. It's about uh, timing is everything and uh, just not that much time left before uh, we get to actual election day. So I do want to say that we are um, here to talk about the process. And this is my cat. Oh. Okay, everybody say hello to Kitty. That's Coach Ben, now go away. All right, he probably won't go away. Um, so we're here to talk about the processing of absentee um, and mail ballots. And by saying that, it's not to talk about the good or the bad of doing absentee ballots that we're happy to address any questions you might have. And it's also not about in-person voting. If you have some questions about in-person voting, I want you to know that election officials throughout the nation have been working really, really hard on making sure that election um, stations are clean, secure, um, well-staffed for November. So there's a lot of attention going to that. And the NCSL's um, newsletter, The Canvas, did address polling places in August and poll workers in July. So if you need some ideas on the in-person side of things, we're happy to take any questions you might have, or you can certainly go look at those. So we are here to talk about the processing of absentee ballots. And of course, many of you know that it used to be fairly common that people voted in person. And then in the primaries, it was a whole different world with uh, far more people voting on an absentee or mail ballot than they had before. And it's hard to scale up from just five to 10% of people using a certain process to all of a sudden 50, 60, 70% of people. And so we saw in the primaries that there were some glitches. We saw uh, places where voters didn't receive their ballot in enough time to be able to cast it return it. We saw voters who made mistakes on how to do their signature or whatever needs to be authenticated on the outside of the envelope. We saw um, polling um, operations where they could not get the ballots open in enough time and it took weeks to process. So those are some reasons to uh, be thoughtful about what happens in November and that's what we can learn about here today that the primaries can be both an example of some success stories on scaling up and some things that we want to learn from. Now we are the National Conference of State Legislatures. That means we care about the policy side of it. There is this whole administrative side. For today, we might mix up the administrative versus policy side, but I will have my ears tuned for anything that legislators could do even still this year or what they would wanna potentially undertake to look at next year when the next sessions come up. So a um, little bit of a policy focus. Um, and before I introduce our all-star cast, I do want to introduce my all-star colleague, Brian Hinkle. Brian, would you pop on here and tell us a little of the housekeeping part, please? Sure. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Hinkle. I'm a research analyst uh, with the National Conference of State Legislators, and I work for Wendy, who's a great boss. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, you will have been muted upon joining the uh, meeting, and if you want to speak later, you'll just have to unmute yourself. Um, We'll have Q&A portion later and you can drop any questions that you have in the chat. Um, if you do wish to speak later, you can do so, but any questions drop in the chat so we can keep track and make sure we get to you. Um, and then just so everyone knows, the meeting is being recorded um, and that the recording will usually be available later this week uh, for anyone who's interested. And that's all for me. Thanks again for being here. And I'll just add that um, Brian has been answering questions left and right from people on absentee and mail voting. His email is brian.hinkle at ncsl.org. I'm, of course, happy to answer questions too, but, but mostly they're getting uh, uh, directed to Brian on this topic. All right, now we've got our all-star staff, uh, uh, faculty. Uh, we're going to start with Jed Choate, who comes to us directly from the Broncos uh, Training Center, apparently. Um, when I first got into the elections world, which was 10 years ago, the first thing I did was I, uh, I vote in Colorado. So I called him up and I said, hello, I'm new to this. I don't know anything. And he invited me in and he's been teaching me about elections ever since. So um, uh, he's an excellent uh, um, teacher and friend. 
And then we have Jennifer Morell, and uh, she's a former election official, so she's done it right there at the local level, and now she's the nation's expert on how you validate um, the results of an election. How do you know that the outcome that was uh, provided is the outcome that the voters actually voted on? And she's also a great running partner if you should ever happen to be able to be in town with her. And then we have Nate Persley, who is um, at uh, Stanford's Law School. And um, he is one of the nation's uh, leading experts on everything related to election administration. And this year, with all that's been going on in the primaries and all that's been going on in the courts, to have a um, meeting about these fine points of policy without having a legal expert would just not make any sense. So he will be uh, uh, bringing us that particular angle. Judd, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to mute myself. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Wendy. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Wendy references the fact that I, I just got out of a uh, session with the Denver Broncos. We had 125 uh, players and coaches uh, that um, we did a sort of a voter reg and how do elections work in Colorado kind of presentation for them. Uh, really pretty cool. The sports teams are taking uh, their civic roles very seriously now and uh, I've got something scheduled with the Nuggets here a couple of weeks hopefully they're still in the playoffs but uh, I have my fears um, uh, and by the way I would just note for the record that uh, while I am the lucky person with the mic um, Leslie Reynolds who is the executive director of NAS is here joining us and Peggy Reeves a long time Election director in Connecticut is with us. Uh, Mitchell Brown, Dr. Brown from Auburn University. So we've got an all-star cast in the audience. Um, so if I somehow drop the mic, I, hopefully one of those um, experts will pick it up for us. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about the way Colorado does vote by mail and specifically uh, ballot verification, since that's our topic for today. I'm just going to touch on some high points, but do think of some questions because I think we're going to have a round table at the end, which will allow you an opportunity to ask anything uh, that we didn't cover. So in Colorado, um, we mail, we're a vote by mail state. So we mail ballots to all active voters. Uh, a little subtlety. Uh, under federal law, you inactivate voters when uh, they have a bad mailing address. So um, under Colorado law and under federal law, uh, you have to hold those people in an inactive status for a couple of cycles in order to um, uh, make sure that they don't reappear in Colorado and attempt to vote, and then you can cancel them. So little subtlety that we mail to all of our active voters, not just our fully registered voters, uh, but it's uh, just a small fraction uh, is inactive. Um, we do that at 25 days under, under our state law. This year, that's going to be October 9th. Typically, our mailing um, uh, window is 22 to 18 days, but uh, the 22nd day this year is Columbus Day, which under law means we can go back to the previous Friday, which is October 9th. It gives us 25 days. Um, we, of course, have UACABA voters. Those are our military and overseas voters. We mail to them at the 45-day deadline, so much earlier. But for the vast majority of our electorate, we're mailing at 25 days. So um, voters will receive their ballots and can uh, either drop them off at a drop box. We have 350 plus here in Colorado. We also have 350 plus VSPCs. Those are our polling places. Those are basically vote centers. They're different than polling places, and we can talk about that if you're interested. But uh, those can be dropped off in person or mailed back through the United States Postal Service. The uh, distribution of people who mail uh, versus those who drop, about 75% of our returned mail ballots are dropped, and only 25% come back through the United States Postal Service. Just as a side note and perhaps off script, that's one of the reasons why I am against putting postage on return ballots and why I'm against postmarks and instead really want to have a ballot in hand on election night because I don't want to put more eggs in the USPS basket. I would rather people receive their ballot by mail but then vote them person, I mean, vote them by dropping them in a drop box. Um, so I, I prefer that sort of uh, method over some of our other states that are also vote by mail states. How do we process these ballots? 
Well, the first thing we have to do is we scan them into the system. So meaning we sort of bank them in so that we know that you voted. Um, the importance here is that if you were to receive a ballot in the mail, you vote that ballot and then you try to come in in person and vote again. Well, the only way that we know not to issue you a ballot in person is if we have scanned in that mail ballot that we've received. Either way, you're only gonna get to vote once, but we wanna make sure and prevent um, a person from voting once with their mail ballot and then coming in subsequent to that and trying to vote in person uh, because we'd rather that people don't attempt to break the law. So uh, that's one of the motivations uh, about uh, trying to scan those in as soon as possible. Either way, the first one that gets scanned in is the one that counts and the other, uh, any other ballots will be uh, void and um, if you attempt to vote twice, we're going to turn that over to you to the district attorney for he or, he or she to prosecute. Um, a bipartisan team reviews that ballot uh, and verifies to, to determine whether the signature on the back of the envelope matches the signature that's on file for that voter. Uh, if a if the um, the person who does that first review decides that the signature does not match. It is required to go to a bipartisan team, a Democrat and a Republican, which then review that signature to determine whether either one of them can count that ballot. If either one of them says, yeah, I think that's close enough, then that ballot counts. But if both of them say no, which is typically the way this works, uh, then that is not a ballot that we can verify. And they then go into the cure pile. So under Colorado law, counties must notify a person that a ballot could not be tabulated because it couldn't be verified that you were the person who uh, voted the ballot. And we reach out to those voters and ask them to cure, meaning you can provide a copy of one of your 16 IDs under Colorado law, and then a new signature affirming that you did attempt to vote and that you are the person who voted that original ballot then your ballot will be accepted and your uh, votes will be tabulated. If you do not do that, that ballot remains uncured and will not be counted in that election. There are curable mistakes and there are uncurable mistakes. The curable mistakes are the mistakes where your signature doesn't match, you failed to sign at all, or you were ID deficient, meaning that when you registered to vote, you did not provide an ID. And uh, that means that you have to provide an ID when you vote because your signature isn't enough. So um, if you fail to include an ID or you don't include a signature or we can't verify that signature, all three of those can be cured. If however, you return your ballot after 7 p.m. on election night, we can't cure that one. Also, if you return more than one ballot in an envelope, we can't cure that one. Lots of times that happens with husbands and wives who think they'll save 55 cents by returning both ballots in the same envelope. That's not gonna work because we don't know who to give vote credit to. So um, those are examples of ballots that we cannot cure. So um, uh, that's kind of an example of the way we process. Uh, you have until eight days after the election to, to do any of these cures. The counties themselves have to notify you right away. So let's say you submit your ballot 15 days prior to the election and you have eight days after the election, so you have 23 days to cure your signature problem or cure your ID problem so that you can get that ballot tabulated. But regardless, even if you vote on election day, you still have eight more days to make that cure. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, this year we are instituting ballot tracking. So every voter in the state of Colorado who has an email on file will receive uh, email notifications or potentially text or voice notifications if they make this selection, telling them about the progress of their ballot, that their ballot has been um, created, has been mailed, and then once you get it and you return it, that that ballot has been received by the county and it's been tabulated by the county. So every voter in the state that, signed, that has an email in their file, which is about 40% of our electorate, uh, they will receive these notifications. And anyone who signs up after that, which they, we have a sign up page that they can sign up, uh, they can also uh, receive those notifications as well. And by the way, you don't have to choose just email. You can also sign up for texts or by voice. So those are all different things that we're doing uh, to try to 
make mail ballots as functional and um, safe and fraud free as possible. Jad, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, just, uh, I think it'll help sure. clarify at this point. Uh, these come from Barbara. Uh, she asked, um, is it the ballot that gets scanned? And that's because you talked about the scanning before you talked about the signature verification. Uh, so what's the order and what gets scanned and then what percentage are um, need, uh, need some kind of a cure? Great question. So um, it's sort of two different scans. So I shouldn't use the word scan. I use sort of the euphemistic bink, you know, do you bink in a ballot? Well, so that's what you're doing when you originally receive a ballot. You are just telling you're using the scanner, the code on, on the outside of the return envelope to bink in the ballot, to tell our voter reg system, I've got this voter's ballot. Now, then we'll go through the process of verifying and then batching and then um, scanning and tabulating. So way later in the process are you actually scanning the physical ballot. At this point, you're just making sure that the voter reg system knows that a ballot has been received for Barbara Costello. Uh, and then the second question was, what percentage do we not count uh, based on um, uh, cure problems or uh, verification problems? So uh, the first batch of ballots that cannot be verified, this is pre-cure, is around 0.7% uh, statewide. So it's less than 1% of the ballots. Um, and then of that 0.7%, uh, around 0.3%, or just less than half, can then be cured or are usually cured in a typical election cycle. So at the end of the day, the percentage of ballots that we cannot accept because they have been rejected for the various curable causes is 0.4%. Uh, and that usually held, holds steady across most of our elections. So we're talking about about four out of a thousand that cannot be um, tabulated because we can't verify the identity for some, some reason that is curable. I hope that, well, that helps. That's perfect. Um, and thank you very much, Judd. I really appreciate Judd, that uh, uh, good insight into Colorado's process. Jennifer, let's turn to you and, and you're going to take a little bit more of a national perspective. Great. Uh, thanks, Wendy and Brian and NCSL for inviting me uh, to be here. I'm really excited to be joining all of you today. So I want to step back and just start by stating uh, that all forms of voting, including mail or absentee voting, bring a variety of risks. Uh, but we know that those risks can be managed, just like they are for in-person voting, meaning that there are various policies, procedures, and controls around the mail ballot process uh, that build layers of safeguards to defend the process from manipulation. And similar to the safeguards for in-person voting, uh, a mail or an absentee voter must be registered to vote before receiving a ballot. The voter is validated before a ballot package is accepted. A ballot is then separated from the ballot package for voter privacy or voter anonymity. And then the envelopes are kept, designating that the voter has voted in case they try to double vote. Double vote. Uh, and then that ballot is counted. So the, the safeguards are very similar to what we have in place for in-person voting. Uh, as you all know, uh, the mail or absentee voting process can vary from state to state. And we just heard Judd describe that process in Colorado. Um, even so, there are procedural safeguards and physical control mechanisms that can be implemented to build resiliency into the system and provide election officials with a way to protect, uh, detect, respond, and recover if a problem occurs. And I want to repeat that one more time because I think it's so important. Uh, if you don't remember anything else I say today, remember this. There are procedural safeguards and physical control mechanisms that can be implemented to build resiliency into the system. And while some states do a better job than others in requiring these safeguards or security mechanisms, all 50 states and territories have protocols uh, for the four things I'm going to talk about very quickly, and that's verification, reconciliation, chain of custody, and validation or auditing. So I want to start with uh, the security created by verification. First of all, election staff must verify their own identity. And this is usually done with a password and two-factor authentication before they access the voter database or the election management system. And this occurs every single time. 
They have to enter voter registration information, enter an application for an absentee ballot, extract voter information to create that mail ballot packet that goes out to the voter. Check in, or as Judd said, bink, uh, a mail ballot packet that has been returned to the election office. Uh, scan a ballot that's been extracted from the return envelope, and then tabulate the totals once the polls have been closed and results are ran. Second, we verify a voter's identity. When they register to vote, when they request an absentee ballot, uh, we know that return ballot envelopes must be signed by the voter and they attest under penalty of perjury. And I think that that's really important to recognize that they're signing a declaration um, verifying or validating that they are the entity that filled out that ballot and who is casting or sending that ballot to the election official. The signature on that declaration is often further verified and Judd talked about the process in Colorado uh, where it's checked against the signature on file. Other states require identification information or uh, a witness or notary signature. Uh, in some states, the voter cannot be validated or authenticated and that voter is contacted to verify that the ballot packet was submitted by him or her and, and we call that normally a cure process. That also is a safety mechanism or a verification that ensures if they were not the person who submitted the ballot, the issue can be identified and dealt with accordingly. Then we verify the ballot itself. So most ballots have style codes that might be tiny marks or code channels or QR codes that are verified by the voting system. And generally these are proprietary, are in a proprietary format and they can only be interpreted by a specific type of voting equipment. So if the codes are not recognized by the equipment, the, val the ballot gets rejected and requires a manual review uh, by the election official. Ballots must also be printed on a specific type of paper. And if the ballot is printed on paper that doesn't match those specifications, so such as the length or maybe the paper weight, then the voting equipment again will reject that ballot and require further review. And both of these things should be tested prior to sending ballots out as part of the logic and accuracy testing that every jurisdiction normally performs. Finally, uh, we verify the mail piece once it enters the US postal system. So USPS has provided an election mail logo that must be approved by a mail design analyst. So you can't just go make up your own and slap it on an envelope. Um, and it helps identify official ballots. And then many states, um, again, as Judd mentioned, the ballot tracking uh, technology that Colorado is using, many states and jurisdictions are leveraging that same uh, technology through use of intelligent mail barcoding to really enable ballot tracking as a security mechanism to ver verify uh, delivery to the voter and receipt of the ballots into the election office and sort of provide this digital chain of custody along the way. So that was the first security uh, control we have in place. The second security uh, mechanism is created through ballot reconciliation. Uh, ballot reconciliation provides a way to consistently and accurately record the number of ballots in an election official's pos possession um, at any given point in time and document any changes. And so by requiring an accounting or reconciling, we reduce the chance of voted ballots being misplaced uh, and left uncounted. And this occurs throughout the mail ballot process. Uh, I don't have time today to go through all of those steps where uh, accounting or reconciling occurs, but anytime uh, there is a physical uh, transfer of pieces of paper, uh, a physical count has to be performed of those pieces of paper. So when I say pieces of paper, that could mean return ballot envelopes, extracted ballots, ballots removed, for signature verification or requiring duplication or ballots that are being scanned and counted. And we're always doing this balancing then to ensure that those physical pieces of paper equal the number of voters given credit for returning a ballot. Chain of custody is the next security mechanism. And um, hopefully we've got, I'm sure we've got a, a number of uh, attorneys and lawyers on the phone. So uh, chain of custody actually is a term that comes or is used quite frequently in the law. And it's proving that an item has been properly handled through an unbroken chain of custody. And this is a must, right? In a court of law, it assures that the evidence is authentic and was never unaccounted for. So the chain of custody for an election is documentation that should provide that same assurance. 
uh, that ballots are authentic and accounted for at each point in the process where they are physically or electronically transferred. So that's from the time they're printed, issued, delivered, cast, transported, scanned, duplicated, reconciled, audited, stored. Anytime they're physically being transferred, um, somebody's going to sign that log. And chain of custody logs, uh, I love them because they really become a story uh, that follows about its journey through the voting process and provides evidence uh, to relieve any uncertainty that a ballot has been tampered with by indicating when and who took possession of them each time they are physically moved. And because of time, uh, I want to, I, I am not going to go into, again, every, every piece of the process where a chain of custody document might be signed, but I do want to illustrate this by giving you one example of just a quick list of the typical items that would be verified and recorded on a chain of custody log for mail ballot drop boxes, since we've seen a lot about mail ballot drop boxes in the news. So a bipartisan team of two would record their names, uh, the date that they arrived at that ballot drop box and the time that they arrived at that box. They're gonna verify the security seal, making sure that it's un intact on the door and they're gonna initial or sign that form. Uh, they're going to inspect that drop box for signs of tampering. They'll unlock the access door. They'll remove the ballots. Sometimes that includes transferring ballots to a ballot transfer bo box or bag. And if that happens, uh, they're going to record seal numbers for that transfer box or bag onto that chain of custody document. And then they're going to verify that the door is closed and locked. They're going to reapply a new security seal and record that number. They're going to load everything into their ve vehicle and then they're going to go through that form and they're going to verify that each of those steps that I rapidly uh, just sh shared with you have all been done. Uh, they're going to sign it or initial it. They're going to note the time that they departed that Dropbox and they're going to repeat that process and they're going to fill out that, in that form in its entirety every single time they collect from a ballot Dropbox on every single day. Okay, so finally, uh, the, the last sort of security piece in all of this is that we validate or we audit how the system functioned and ensure that those procedural safeguards and those physical control mechanisms work. So typically this is done uh, through post-election tabulation audits of the voting system. That's one way we audit, such as risk limiting audits, where we can validate the outcome of the election. Uh, many of you have heard me talk about that. Uh, but there are also states that require an audit of the reconciliation documents and the chain of custody logs as part of your canvas or your certification process. And I think that this is one area where we could use some future legislative work in thinking about the, the kinds and types of things that we would like to verify or audit or validate at the end of an election uh, to sort of further ensure the integrity of that election. So with that, I will end. Uh, that was a little bit like a magic that you were able to hit points <laughs> in that short amount of time. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's a question in here about whether emails or phone numbers that are collected for uh, the purpose of uh, ballot tracking are ever distributed. And we've got the answer from Colorado. Do you know around the nation whether this kind of information tends to be uh, part of the voter record and therefore is distributable? Yeah, so most of the jurisdictions that are using uh, ballot tracking capabilities are working through a third party vendor and that's normally part of that contract that that information is kept is not shared or distributed to other parties so the, the quick answer is is no and it doesn't usually become part of the voter record. Uh, I think it just depends on the contract that they have with that vendor. Okay, and I'll, I'll say that we do have a list on uh, uh, the use of, of um, we, excuse me, we have a web page on the use of voter lists. I'm not sure it's 100% up to date, but we could go take a look at that, um, Anne, if you're interested. And then one more question before we come over to you, uh, Nate. Uh, um, and Matt from Pennsylvania asks about uh, community groups that may circulate um, applications may distribute applications. They may even uh, fill them in in part. How does this inter intersect with the work that officials do either at the state or local level? And later on, you can read that in Michigan, there's a little duplication going on there. This is probably a great question for Judd to chime in as well. Uh, 
in my work, I'm always advocating for these third party groups to, to actually use the official form and drive voters to the official uh, mail ballot portal uh, by doing their own form or they're creating their own sort of system. It actually makes things a lot more difficult for the local official to efficiently and quickly process those. And actually, sometimes those forms don't get completed correctly or they don't have the right information. And so they actually end up being invalid. And that creates a huge problem because that voter thinks they've registered or thinks that they've created an absentee application when in fact it cannot be processed. So if any of you have connections to any of those groups, please, please, please encourage them to use the official form, drive voters to the state uh, website or state portal. Great. I appreciate that very much, uh, Jennifer. All right, Nate, are you ready to go? Sure thing. Let me, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk with PowerPoint here, so I'll share my screen. Um, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to talk to a group of election officials, people who are actually in the, in the trenches, as well as legislators who are, who are uh, shaping the rules. And I'm going to talk about fighting over the rules, uh, and in particular, what is happening right now in courts uh, with the challenges that are being lodged uh, to mail balloting and um, uh, other and, and absentee voting during the pandemic. I'll, I'll, I'll go relatively quickly uh, through this um, because to go in deep would take uh, a semester's class because there have now been over 200 cases that have been filed related to voting changes that have happened due to the pandemic. That doesn't even include some other um, uh, case sort of your typical election voting rights cases. We will have, it looks like we are uh, maybe no surprise about to set a record for a total amount of election litigation for this uh, election. Um, and in part that's because uh, there are such massive changes that are going on uh, in our electoral system because of the, of the changes to adapt to the pandemic. Um, I'm going to focus just on the, the mail ballot cases. I should say, um, as, as you can see in the title slide, we've started up this project, Charles Stewart at MIT and I, uh, the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project, and you can see all the research we have at healthyelections.org, and we have several state memos there as well. And this, um, this presentation and uh, the memo that accompanies it, which you can see at this top URL, on mail ballot cases was done by a, a group of students that we've uh, brought in. Um, the basic uh, story here, right, is that mail balloting, you know, while, while there are plenty of opportunities uh, in the in-person realm to litigate cases, Lord knows we saw that in the 2000 election controversy, for example, um, there are a lot of um, different types of cases that can be brought when it comes to mail balloting. Uh, I'm going to use the words mail balloting and absentee balloting interchangeably, um, um, but I'll, I'll try to highlight the differences um, uh, when it's relevant. Um, and that's because there, there's sort of a, a longer life cycle to an absentee ballot than there is to, you know, in-person polling place uh, ballot. And so that we see litigation at each stage, at the application process, the eligibility to get a ballot, the process for submitting a ballot, the verification, and then uh, the normal counting process. Um, where we are right now is that there are some cases that have been resolved. Indeed, we've even had, you know, some cases that have gone to the Supreme Court um, um, related to mail balloting already, uh, but that uh, we should be getting a series of decisions in the next month, uh, which will hopefully settle the rules uh, going forward for this election. The, the material that judges are using and that plaintiffs are, are uh, basing their claims on comes from different sources. Um, and it's not equally um, uh, representative here in terms of the amount of litigation. Now, if you're in federal court, um, the kind of litigation that surrounds uh, mail balloting is the kind that surrounds, uh, you know, some of it is common to all election litigation, right? When you make an argument about the right to vote being implicated, you are saying that um, the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, um, has uh, been violated. And that's... Um, that was true for Bush versus Gore. It's true for uh, people who think the absentee ballots have been either that they are committing fraud or that they are um, uh, being deprived of the right to vote through absentee ballots. So you, you lodge it with that. If there's a racially discriminatory impact or if there is uh, implications for language minorities, then there are provisions under the Federal Voting Rights Act. Similarly, 
when it comes to uh, uh, people with disabilities. And obviously the mail balloting process can be um, uh, pose unique challenges for people with disabilities, uh, then you will get some kinds of uh, litigation under the ADA and, and related uh, uh, disability protections and other federal laws. Um, um, but most of, of what you will see is in the bottom right hand quadrant there, or sixth of the page, and that is state law claims, right? And, and, and that's sort of the moral of the story here, which is that we are going, we are seeing now, and we'll see over the next month, inconsistent resolution to a lot of these claims so that in some states, uh, you know, under state law, it's going to be perfectly fine to change the deadline very late in the process, but in other states, it's not going to be uh, fine. And so uh, different states have different rules and uh, the judges in those states will be interpreting them differently. And so actions at the local level um, uh, will be seen as, you know, disenfranchising in some uh, areas of the country, whereas in others, it'll be uh, just following the law. I should say by way of, um, uh, uh, well, before I get to that slide, let me just say something sort of at the, at the 500 foot level here, which is the kind of categories of litigation that we are seeing uh, as a result of, um, you know, the transitions that are happening. The first is a category of litigation that, um, questions the legality of, of making a transition to greater use of the mail in balloting um, or moving away from polling places. And so you're seeing this in Nevada and uh, New Jersey and elsewhere, the states that have moved to uh, all vote by mail, even in California. And so part of those arguments are that, that it dilutes the votes of um, other voters because it's more likely to um, lead to fraud, right? And then there's others uh, claims that it violates state law um, to make a wholesale change to the electoral system like that. So there, there's a category of sort of cases that fall into that bucket, most of which I think are gonna be unsuccessful. Then there are the specific, well, th then there's a category of, of general mail ballot related litigation that I'll go into. And that is, um, um, and this could happen, this could have happened four years ago or two years ago, not necessarily to this period. And that is, uh, types of cases dealing with deadlines, right? Types of cases dealing with just the signature mismatch cases, the uh, inability to cure, uh, the lateness of ballots, right? If you get into a recount situation, um, whether it's the Bush versus Gore recount or the Minnesota Senate uh, case recount, um, you will always have those kinds of arguments uh, that focus on the legality of certain votes and the illegality of others, right? But then there are the category of cases which are, are sort of COVID related, which are those cases where um, either the existence of the pandemic is leading to lawyers say, look, these are the rule, these are the normal rules, but given the situation with the pandemic, you need to move toward a different rule. And that's because if you keep, keep in place the current rule that it's unconstitutional, it would mean that people have to um, risk their lives in order to vote. And so we see this with um, some of the deadlines cases, right? So that cases where you say that the deadlines have to be extended because the pandemic has caused great stress on the system or the massive move to mail balloting in a lot of uh, states is now causing unprecedented stress. And so therefore we need to, to change some of the rules, right? Um, even, uh, you know, questions about age limits, right? Wh which uh, there was a famous case in Texas about whether you could, whether everybody has a, a kind of COVID related excuse um, um, to, to not have to show up at the polls and then could cast a mail ballot. Or as the Texas court held, it's okay if you have presumptive, you know, ability of people over the age of 65 to cast a mail ballot, but everyone else uh, does not have the right to cast a mail ballot without an excuse. But it really just, again, depends on these different sources of law. But as I was saying before, um, mail ballot litigation just, there are simply more stages in the mail balloting process that allow for litigation. Um, because this is, and this is Charles Stewart's uh, slide in a really, um, prominent article that he wrote called Losing Votes by Mail. He's my you know, comrade in arms in the Stanford MIT project. Um, that you will get at each stage of the, of the absentee ballot uh, life cycle, the requesting of the ballot, the validation of the identification in order to get the ballot, 
the receipt, the sending out, and then the receiving of the ballot by the um, by the voter. Uh, errors that could occur in the marking of the ballot. Problems with respect to returning the ballot, validating it, and then having uh, the vote counted. Right. And so, just to focus on these, and these are all examples of of claims of actual cases that have been filed so far this cycle, mostly related to the primaries that have happened, but some in preparation for the general. So as I mentioned before, that there's a set of cases which are focusing on whether rolling out all vote by mail makes fraud easier and that therefore um, that is unconstitutional. And the argument there is that you're diluting the votes of actual voters by, by running the risk of fraud. Those are more kind of headline grabbing kinds of cases more than they are uh, likely uh, to succeed. Um, but when it comes to the deadlines, right, uh, and the other requirements for uh, requesting an absentee ballot, uh, those are ones where the judges are taking sort of equitable considerations, constitutional considerations into uh, uh, affecting their decisions and then uh, maybe uh, releasing and, and making the deadlines more flexible. Um, then we have these set of cases like the Texas case that I was mentioning before having to do with who is eligible to vote absentee whether COVID-19 is an excuse in and of itself, right? So in those states that do not allow for no excuse absentee balloting, um, does the fear of contracting the virus then give you either a constitutional or state right uh, to vote by mail, right? And, and so far, um, the, the cases are tending to say, no, you don't have sort of a constitutional right to, to um, necessarily vote by mail just because you might fear getting infection in the polling place, but there are some, there are definitely some states that are, that are going in a different uh, direction. I mentioned the age limits case again, that one's, that one could easily go to the Supreme Court in the next month, uh, uh, because that, 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 the argument there is that it violates the 26th Amendment, um, which Garrett says that you may not discriminate on the basis of age with respect to voting. So if you allow, um, uh, uh, older people presumptively to vote by mail, why can't younger people uh, do that as well? Um, the last uh, uh, half of cases, right, the, the submission of the mail ballots with the, the respect to the deadlines, bans on voter assistance as well as so-called ballot harvesting, right, are becoming um, an active area uh, as particularly Democrats are trying to ensure that, that people, so, uh, going back to the chain of custody point that Jen Morrell was mentioning, um, that, uh, you know, that there's one argument that, that you have to allow voters, particularly those who are scared of going outside to be able to give their ballot to someone else to then drop in a mailbox or, or a drop box, uh, particularly those with, with disabilities and then others who say that that's an invitation uh, for fraud. Um, and we have litigation over postage, right? Whether requiring postage, uh, uh, be paid by the, the voter is constitutional or not. Um, but most of the litigation that we will see, right, in the, in the days, uh, in the week before and after, I think with respect to mail balloting will be the kind of garden variety, which is to say that the normal kinds of litigation you get in close elections with mail balloting. Um, we've already had some on the requirements for mail ballots, like whether, especially during the pandemic, you can uh, require witnesses and signatures and notaries and the like, because right now, if you're living home alone, um, going out to get a notary or going out to get a witness uh, might be uh, burdensome. Um, um, but uh, the most frequent kinds of litigation are the ones that Judd was sort of hinting toward in talking about the ways that, that ballots can be disqualified. And um, that you know, becomes the, the game when uh, an election is close. Um, are, are the signatures mismatched? Was it late? The litigation that we saw over the New York um, absentee ballot fiasco uh, is characteristic of that, um, where you see, you know, these problems with what if it does, if you require a postmark, but there isn't a postmark on it, um, how do you know whether it was, uh, it was mailed uh, before the deadline and the like. I'll say that, that we at Stanford, and I, I put up a tiny URL so you can get access to this report. Uh, Judd was kind enough to speak to my class on this. We had a group of students who was just really interested in signature matching. Um, Stanford students never cease to amaze me uh, in their, uh, in their uh, range of interests. Uh, but we actually did this in the fall last year, uh, not knowing the pandemic was going to hit and, um, and produced this uh, report, 100 page report on signature verification. So I commend it all to you and happy to take any questions.
Wendy, I think you might be muted. There we go. I think we got it. Um, all right. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. That was uh, just fabulous. Uh, would you take a minute to tell us a little bit more about uh, the class? Um, why were students so excited about this and what are the hitches? I mean, if we hear that, oh, we have a bipartisan team looking at them and now all's well, there must be something more if you could do a whole class on it. So give us a little bit more on what does it mean to do signature verification? So um, I'll tell you the sort of genealogy of this, which is that when I was the research director of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, and we had um, several hearings around the, the country, I think it may even have been the same one that Judge Choate testified at, but Dean Logan, uh, you know, director of elections for Los Angeles, had um, mentioned something in his testimony, which is that, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to match signatures because you know, they don't teach cursive in school, right? And so young people just don't have signatures anymore. Something a lot of election officials, you know, you're, you're familiar with and, you, and we do see quite a number of errors, disproportionate number of errors among first time voters and young voters. Um, and so when I was teaching my law of democracy class, which is like my voting rights class, uh, some students thought that was really interesting. And then one of them ended up working for the ACLU in California during the passage of this new law that we have called the Every Vote Counts Act, which deals with when you can disqualify uh, ballots on the basis of signatures. And so what the students, they were interested and ambitious enough, they got a group together and I said, sure, I'll teach on this. I know, you know, I know people like Judd Choate, I can bring them in and talk about this. Um, uh, and so uh, it really has, they really went down the rabbit hole. And look, every state has, has differences in how they do the verification process, you know, and how likely it is that the signatures will lead to bouncing of ballots. And, you know, there is technology that is used for signature matching, and then there's the human component. And so there's an art and science. Colorado has, I think, the most developed um, sort of pamphlet out there or guidebook on um, signature matching, right? But other states and uh, other uh, firms even have different ones. So that was, there's a lot of material out there. And so, um, and, I, and, and I'll say the report then did affect some of the new regulations that the Secretary of State has put into place. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, and Jennifer, when you talked earlier, you talked about the signature ver verification process as part of the security uh, for elections. I just want to point out that not all states have a cure process. So there's a data point that legislatures could be looking at into the future. If there's not a way for a voter to have a second chance to say that's mine or for the election official. And it looks like Judd would like to jump in on that. Um, go ahead, Judd and Jennifer, then we'll come back to you. Yeah, so one thing to keep in mind here, especially with a group of state legislators, is uh, the key is to provide your elections officials enough time to be able to do this. Because so many states have these really crunched post-election calendars where they have to, uh, election day happens on the 3rd, they have to certify on the 6th, they have to do contests by the 8th, they have to do recounts by the 11th. I mean, these frankly ridiculous post-election calendars which cannot be achieved if you're going to try to cure so if you're doing a cure you're going to need to think about what does my post-election calendar look like and give your elections officials enough time to be able to achieve all of the benchmarks for a quality election a lot of the what uh, jennifer was laying out uh, earlier in her presentation great jennifer do you want to jump in yeah. on that yeah, I'll just add, uh, you know, it was mentioned earlier, signature verification is nor neither an art nor a science, it's somewhere in the middle. And, you know, ideally in an ideal process, you have at least more than one individual making that determination. So Judd sort of talked about the tiered process in Colorado, uh, where there are challenges in other states is that either staff make that determination and it may go to a board of elections. And so that might be the second review where the board might make a determination to accept or reject it uh, and still no notification to the voter. Other states staff make that decision. It's a, you know, once one look and we're done and um, it's up to the voter. They can challenge that to the board, but there's no notification. So there really does seem to be a lot of discrepancy in both the, the method or the way that election officials go about that process, as well as the way that it gets escalated and, and voters notified. And can I just say in, in, the, you know, in the COVID environment, and when you're talking about some states having 10 times the number of absentee ballots than they've had previously, 
um, it, it, especially if a lot of them are coming in the last few days, you can imagine what the election officials are going the pressure that they're going to be un, under with respect to the deadlines. And let me say this as one who's someone who's not an election official, so I can just uh, <laughs> amplify uh, uh, those who have a self-interest in this, which is, right, right, I mean, as much controversy as there was, uh, you know, with the, what the postal postmaster general said about the um, the inadequacy of these deadlines with respect to the post office. That's true throughout everything that we're talking about here, which is that if you have this mass of ballots that are dumped on election officials in the last 48 hours of the election, um, the deadlines in the statutes are simply not prepared to handle that. Uh, that is a great segue into uh, deadlines to apply for absentee ballots. And that is something that's been right there uh, front and center in the news. Um, NCSL has data on this and I believe Brian's put the table in the um, uh, uh, chat box. So what we've got is some states, uh, you can ask for an absentee ballot on the Monday before the election or the Friday before the election and try to imagine processing that ballot application request at that point and getting that ballot out. Oh, wait a minute, it may not have even gotten to the voter by the time it needed to be voted and back in. So some states, uh, Arizona is an example, their deadline is 11 days prior to election day. So Jed, I'm gonna ask you to jump in and talk about, I know you don't have this because you're mailing out ballots to everybody, but what's the right amount of time? And if a state moves from something that's close to election day to something that's far out, would policymakers be accused of voter suppression in making that shift? Uh, I, I see the argument um, for the voter suppression idea, but gosh, it doesn't feel like voter suppression to me. I, I always think of voter suppression as, am I taking away something that the voter has, something that is theirs, and, and making it more difficult for them to achieve what they're trying to do, which is to vote. And that doesn't feel like voter suppression to me. So, um, but uh, on, the, on the idea of signing up, I know a lot of my colleagues around the country are doing this. I'll just make, first let me just make a pitch for, just send all your voters a ballot. And then you don't have to go through this two stage process because you think about what you're forcing your elections administrators to do. You're saying, okay, I know you have this election to get ready for here in a couple of months, but what I need you to do now is concentrate all of your energies on getting a piece of paper to a voter, asking them, do you want your ballot in the mail, getting that information back, making the change to their database so that then you can get that list to the, uh, to the print vendor so that they can send that ballot. That's a whole bunch of moving parts where something can go wrong. If you just give them the list, of your voters and say, send all these people a ballot. You have skipped about six different major hurdles there and you've given your elections administrators a chance for success. By asking them to do this pre-mailing, which they then have to process, you are setting them up to fail. Um, and I just feel like a lot of states have, uh, have put their elections administrators in really tough spots. And then even if you've sent them a ballot, you can do all the other stuff. You can have in person, you can uh, do all the verification things we're talking about. You've just taken away that centerpiece. So, uh, but to get back to your central question, I think you gotta give your voters at least three weeks to be able to receive these ballots and be able to turn them around because I personally do not trust that the post office will give, uh, will be able to receive a ballot in the mail a week prior to the election and get that to uh, the elections administrator within that week. I don't trust them. And so for that purpose, I'm trusting them to get my ballots to my voters, but I'm not trusting them to get my voters ballots back to me. And uh, that's why we have 350 drop boxes around the state. That's why we have 350 VSPCs where you can drop your ballot. And that's why 75% of our voters vote uh, and drop their ballots instead of returning through the USPS because they see that concern too. And they want their ballot to get to an election administrator as quickly and seamlessly as possible. Uh, thanks, Jed. I, I do need to point out that uh, Jed gets to be an advocate for mail voting because he was there in Colorado when they moved in that direction. At NCSL, we're not advocates for um, all mail voting. We're neither uh, opponents of it. There's, uh, it's hard for a state to make that kind of shift. There's all kinds of cultural and historical things. And the key question, somebody kind of put it in here, shouldn't the voter have some responsibility? Do they need to uh, uh, take that step to say, yes, that's how they want to vote? I want to move on to another one of our deadlines, and that is when should um, processing of these absentee ballots 
um, begin. And Jennifer, I'm gonna ask you to address this. I, the, what we're hearing is that if your law says you can't open an absentee ballot until election day, you're gonna have a long period after election day while you're doing it. So Jennifer, what's good practice on that front? Yeah, good practice is really to start processing those as soon as they came in. And some of those things I mentioned around reconciliation and chain of custody are a lot easier to do when you're dealing with daily inflow, building up to the election day. Uh, you get the opportunity to really sort of test and perfect those processes uh, versus trying to cram it all in um, from election day through certification. And I think uh, where some of the um, concerns have been raised are really around um, just misinformation about what is taking place. So when we talk about opening or processing early, we're not talking about tabulating, we're not talking about looking at results, we're simply talking about moving that ballot and accounting it through every stage of the process of checking it in, verifying it. Opening and extracting might sound easy, it can be one of the biggest bottlenecks in a vote by mail process. So physically taking that ballot out, preparing it to be scanned, dealing with any issues that that scan scanner might encounter, so much easier when you don't have that pressure uh, of trying to, again, get all of these done in that short window of time. Much more uh, focus can be placed on quality uh, when you can extend that out. So uh, best practices start uh, as soon as they start coming in, Keep up with them each day. Try to start election day as close to zero as you can, because that's really where the majority of those ballots are going to come in, and you're still going to have challenges getting them all done in time. Great. Uh, so that's another policy point that legislators could be thinking about. Um, uh, there's one more deadline I want to talk about, and Nate, I'm going to ask you to do this. We are coming close to the end of our hour, and NCSL wants us to end on time. So Nate, talk to us a little bit about the um, in-hand of time versus um, post-March by. What, what's the pros and cons of allowing ballots to uh, be treated in those two ways? Well, Judd's uh, pointed in one direction on that, which is that if you're talking in hand is a clear rule, right? You know where it is, if it's either in your hand, you know, at that, at that time or not. Um, I mean, there are, there are still ways you can litigate that, but that would be uh, the, the basic definition. Once you start going on the question of postmarks, we then, the, 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 I, one thing I've sort of learned this cycle is that there's almost an existential question as to what is a postmark at this point, right? As to whether in states that don't have, you're not putting a stamp, you're not getting a postmark, what about the, um, you know, the pink barcode that, that's, that's put on the back? Um, and so we saw all of these problems coming up uh, in New York. Um, and, but of course, you know, especially when you're dealing with military ballots, when you're dealing with all kinds of ballots that may be received after election day, that's the advantage of uh, the extension of the deadline, so that it's postmarked by election day, not received by them. Great, I appreciate that. I guess I feel here too, um, there's one um, a set of pulls towards let's count all the ballots and that's making people go to postmarked by, but then you get the after effects. And then uh, I think the other side of saying, hey, this, this is the end point, isn't being heard quite so much. Uh, well, the arguments, uh, again, with the postmark is that if you think that everyone should have the same amount of information at the time that they vote, or at least have the opportunity to have the same amount of information, then absentee voters are kind of at least in the same position as those who vote on election day, so they would end up voting at the same time. Uh, that's a good point. And so I think uh, uh, good minds could have different outcomes on that question. It's up to policymakers to kind yes. of that. I'm gonna breathe deeply. I'm gonna say thank you very much to all of you who uh, came on with us today. This has been great. We do have a series of other um, uh, Zoom meetings and uh, some campaign finance webinars coming right up. I think we'll send you an email after the fact to get that out there. Uh, Judd, Jennifer, and Nate, can we put your emails in that um, yeah. after so people can contact you? And if there's anything we weren't able to address that was in the chat box, um, you can certainly go to Brian or me, Brian.hinkle at ncsl.org, wendy.underhill at ncsl.org. I think that I ended up a way smarter person than I was an hour ago, and I'm very happy about this. Thank you all for being here, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.